This, on the first Sunday of every month, we here at The Way keep alive a practice that for millennia, uh, people who follow the ways of Jesus, who call themselves Christians or followers of the way ever since Jesus uh, prepared to head to the cross, he literally gathered his disciples and pulled them into a meal together. It was a last supper, if you will, throughout the history of the Christian church. We call it the Eucharist in our kind of uh, Western or black church or American churches. We call that stuff communion. But more than anything, it is an opportunity, as the scripture says, to remember consistently and constantly to remember the uh, work and the cause of Jesus Christ and how Christ literally set up a pathway of life and of uh, transformation that we are all invited into. You know, often I think we, we, we have become so familiar with Christianity, if you will, that we forget that it is not just uh, a religious um, pathway t to uh, your eternal kind of security, if you will. Um, I mean, it's a great benefit, somebody say amen to know that, you know, eternity is secure. But it is also an invitation into a way of life while we are here on earth. And quiet as it's kept, the ways of Jesus are not always in alignment with the ways of this world. Uh, the more we live, the more we see, the more we observe, you know, you can kind of appreciate that, man, Jesus was quite a radical individual. I mean, Jesus had all power in his hand and yet rarely used any of it to punish his enemies. Yes. What you think about that? Because some of us, we waiting to get some power. <laughs> some of us struggle our whole lives to get power so we can, you know, bring about some retribution. And yet Jesus used his power to figure out ways to literally convince people that his way of life was more compelling than theirs. It was a consistent act of persuasion, nonviolently, to invite people who were looking for a way of life that would produce freedom and liberation. Literally, Jesus is giving them an opportunity to say, I will choose this way. And it is in this way that I think it is so critical in a moment and in a time where we are watching the rise of violence as a normative response to grievance. We're watching the rise of Christian nationalism. We're watching the rise of of coups and all kinds of things all over the world. I don't know that we could, you know, impact all of that through our own kind of, you know, congregational life. But how many of you know we could always make some decisions in our own lives to consistently choose to walk after the way of Jesus? And in walking after the way of Jesus, we may actually, as this passage will say, find our life along the way. And this is now then the word of God for us that we will read. It comes from Matthew chapter number 16. Uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples literally weeks before he is killed by the Roman Empire of uh, the death penalty, the capital punishment system. Jesus gathers his disciples into a room and he begins to teach them and talk to them about what's about to happen. Let's pick up verse number 21, Matthew chapter number 16. And the scripture says this, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples for his end result, the telos, the purpose of his coming. Peter 
If you know anything about Peter, Peter was a bit of a, you know, hands-on individual. Uh, Peter liked to fight. Peter liked to cuss. Peter uh, liked to, you know, use all of his tools to uh, secure a result that he thought should happen. Many think that Peter uh, was one of the most uh, closest, one of Jesus' most closest comrades and allies. And so Peter, obviously out of a sense of concern, verse number 22 says, took Jesus aside and began to rebuke Jesus. Now you got to be, you got to be somebody. Man, start telling Jesus a piece of your mind. I mean, I don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. I don't know if Peter was worried about Jesus or if Peter was worried about himself. You know, because Peter probably realized, man, if they're coming after you, Jesus, you know, uh, you know, can you give me a warning, praise God, so I can call in sick that day? I don't know. But Jesus, you know, gets rebuked by Peter. Peter says to him, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world? but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk for a few moments simply from the title, Find Your Life. If I was felt a little more ornery and I'd tell you to tell your neighbor to get your life, but they may misunderstand what you're trying to say. So let's pray. God, we say thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your words in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say, thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Now, finding one's life. Jesus is offering you and I an invitation. He has, from the beginning, been offering people invitations. Invitations that are an open door to a way of life. A way of life that when taken seriously is often at odds with your way of life, with my way of life, with our way of life. Life after the ways of Jesus will often put us in conflict with ourselves, with others who have their own vision for your life. Have you ever met someone who has their own vision for your life? <laughs> Maybe your mom and them, your father, your grandparents, your boo, your, 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 your partner, you know. How many of you have plans for other people's lives? Mm -hmm. I know I got some plans for my kids' lives. Like, you are not. <laughs> Amen. You, 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 no, you're not doing this. Not, not today. Mm -mm. And then they do it anyway. And it puts you in conflict. God, why did I have these children? No, just like, no, 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 I never say that. I, I, do, I do be asking myself, you know, my God, why has thou forsaken me, though? <laughs> never question the kids. I question <laughs> everything else about me. Mm -hmm. Conflict. We are always a people who are at risk of being in conflict with God's plans and our plans. And quiet as it's kept, we are in a country that too easily and too often conflates God's plans with this country's plans. 
which then causes us to literally believe that God is co-signing everything we do. Oh, God co-signs my, 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 my vocational journey. God co-signs my entrepreneurial journey. God co-signs my relationship. Everything must be because of God's affirmation of my plans. But yet, you must appreciate that not every road you take will get you to your destination. Or your desired destination. Now, you, you can, you know, get... I remember I was driving back from Duke one time, uh, and I was in my... Uh, I had a Volkswagen Passat. And I, I, I drove that car till about 240,000 miles. So I got this other car and you know, when I turned 40 and... 40 plus... When I turned 40, what is this, 2000? I turned 40 sometime, like six, seven years ago. I don't remember what year that was. 50, 25? No, this is 23. 15. 15? 2015. Mm-hmm. So, Lord, this is, this is, this is rough in here. Y'all, y'all excuse me. I've been, I've been in four cities in five days. I'm just glad to be standing here in, in this one today. <laughs> I remember I was driving home from Duke and I was on the I-20 or the I-10, one of them freeways, and I was driving and I was, I was, I was on my way to, through Tucson and I saw a sign that said Flagstaff. And Tucson was like maybe 200 something miles and Flagstaff said 75. So, you know, in my mind, I was like, wow, I can probably get here in half the time. I didn't check my maps or nothing, because, you know, back then we didn't have the, the iPhone maps, so I just had the printed out one. So whenever you make a detour back then, how many know you taking a detour on faith? <laughs> yeah, you, take, you know, you, you don't put a thing in, you make a wrong turn on these things, and it'll correct you, be like, no. <laughs> Go back to the right path. How many have been on a journey and you didn't hear that voice though? You, had, you end up taking the detour. So I took the detour and you know, I, I'm on this path and it's just straight, you know, 80, 90 miles an hour. I'm flying, car full of just stuff. And I'm driving, I'm driving like, oh yeah, man, I'm making up good time. And then all of a sudden, I head down this big car caravine. And for the next 20 miles, it is mountains mountains and I literally am watching the gas on my car just it just going down my poor Passat start coughing <coughs> and I'm in the middle of nowhere and I'm like I'm too far to turn around so I'm just gonna keep on driving I'm a trust that my little coffin car up and down these mountains, I may run into a gas station in about, I don't know, two hours in, there was a gas station, little, you know, one of them gas stations you find in the Western movies, you know, with one, one thing, and you gotta, you know, I don't know maybe that's water, I don't know, but it was a podunk. <laughs> It was a pull-up gas station. And I thank the Lord. I think that the Lord just put that gas station out of nowhere. It's kind of like creation ex nihilo. God created a gas station out of nothing to help McBride get through a destination, a road that he did not know was getting him further away from where he was trying to go. That is kind of what God often does. God will help you get through a destination or to a destination through a road you did not know was getting you further away. And eventually, after I got through all the mountains and stuff, I kind of had to circle back and go back through because I realized maybe I should go back to the, to the road I knew. It took me three hours out of my journey, but when I got back on the straight line, I made it to my destination and thank God, I made it and I'm still here today. Didn't get eaten up by the coyotes and the Ku Klux Klan. I was probably hiding out there in Arizona somewhere waiting for a nice chocolate brother in a Passat thousands of miles from civilization. 
But what it taught me and what it continues to teach me is that not every road will get us to our destination. And there are moments in our lives where we must make difficult choices about what way I am to go. Now, the question that's in front of so many of us is, how am I to follow Jesus' ways in a world that claims to be following Jesus' ways, but they tend to produce more death than life, more pain than healing, more hatred than love? I think that one of the great tasks of the church today is to continually ask ourselves, are we like Peter in this story? Constantly rebuking Christ's calls to us because it feels or looks dangerous and uncomfortable when we are being invited and asked to go the way that Jesus is going. The way that Jesus is going does not always appear plain to us. We have all these principles of the ways of Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself. And yet, we see our neighbors obviously in a desperate situation. And it is so easy for us to think the worst about our neighbors rather than appreciate that loving our neighbor does require often us to assume the best about them. I am particularly troubled by the ways in which we are increasingly reaching for a criminalization narrative in our country towards all kinds of groups of people. The unhoused being criminalized, our neighbors who are addicted to drugs and substances criminalized, our children who are wilding out in some places criminalized. It is the first knee-jerk response to the vulnerable in our society rather than us asking ourselves, how is Jesus inviting us to find our life in lots or in solidarity with those around us whom Jesus loves? It's easy to love folk you like. Well, easier. Because, you know, when folk you like make mistakes, you kind of have a little bit of credit in the bank, if you will, relational credit. You can kind of assume that, you know, you just had, we, we, just, we just out of alignment. Eventually, we'll get back in alignment. But how I many know there's some folk you don't like that it's not so easy to love? And yet we are invited still very much to move towards a path of finding our life in the spaces and places where Jesus found his life. I was in a conversation this past week about the coverage of the Emeryville young people's chaotic situation. And some of our children from our church, including my daughter, a few folks we knew were out there. And, you know, for an hour, I was out of touch with my daughter. I was scared. I didn't know she was being kidnapped. I didn't know what was happening. And eventually, I drove up and got into the Target parking lot and saw at least 100 kids out there with 8 to 10 sheriffs. Sheriff's cars, these are those cars I saw. There were other police cars, sirens, rifles. Kids just, some wandering around, others were just hanging out, and it became very clear to me that something drastically wrong had happened. And, 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 and although, you know, you get to the bottom of it, it turned out to be, a, you know, I think a, a, a case where there just needed to be some more supervision of our young people. You know, $4 movie theater uh, deal at the... the, 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 the AMC is quite a deal. (laughs) 
And you go in there, you pay $20 and sit there in some well-worn seats, praise God, and overpriced everything. And you know, $4, hey amen, I can go in here and actually enjoy something. Turned out it was, a, it was something all across the country, and we've been talking with the AMC and a few folks to make sure next time they do something like that, be in touch with some of our network so we can actually help ensure it is well supervised. Because the only thing that that situation needed was more adult supervision. Amen. It turned out that it, they, the news tried to say it was hundreds of kids out there fighting, and turned out it was probably about 10. And the other hundreds of kids were pulling out their phone, trying to record the fight like some of us do, you know. <laughs> we see a fight, we don't try to break it up. We pull out our phone and try to start recording it. And the young man had a gun, the gun fell out of his, his pocket and it went off. And that was a gunshot that folks heard. It wasn't people shooting at each other. And they started obviously to panic and trample each other. And, and it was just a very scary situation. But what was so interesting is it turned into this narrative for most of the week that parents ain't parenting their kids. And these kids are just wild and out of control. And we need to lock up all the kids. And these are adults, some of them black folk. And I'm saying to myself, who taught you to fall out of love with your kids? Whereby we are willing to believe the worst narratives about them. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. And I, I'm beginning to appreciate that we are being invited by so many in our society to take a certain pathway towards solving problems or addressing circumstances. And those pathways, I believe, are not always congruent with the commands, demands, and expectations of Jesus. That is just to say that sometimes... Following the ways of Jesus require a certain commitment to some principles. Principles that when applied across the course of your life and decision making will keep you and I in tension with some of our own kind of knee jerk responses. It will put us and keep us in tension uh, with some of the whims of those individuals who claim to be our Leaders, it will put us in tension with some of the, the, the expectations of people that are closest to us. But I want to keep inviting you as Jesus invited his disciples to keep coming toward this way of life, as Jesus would say, that will help you find your life. Because finding one's life, according to Jesus, means that you may have to lose some parts of your life. Finding your life means that you may have to put to death or at least leave behind some assumptions about the way you and I think the world is supposed to be. Finding your life means that you may have to make an uneven exchange with God. You may have to decide that, God, in order for me to find you, I'm going to have to turn in some things that I thought I could not live without. I'm going to have to consider some choices that I thought I was very sure and secure about. And this is why Jesus very powerfully, when, when Peter begins to pull Jesus aside and start to rebuke him, Jesus realizes, you know what, Peter? I have chosen this pathway, and yet you are saying you're following me, and you're trying to move me off of the trajectory of obedience to the way of life, I've already committed my will toward. It is just to suggest one of the first keys to finding your life is that you will have to contend with the naysayers, the skeptics. Even those who are close to you, they may not always appreciate that God has given a path for us that may not always align with their path. But God's commitment to you and I is that if you follow the path towards my life, 
you will find your life. I got to say, you know, sometimes finding my life is easier said than done. Because there are a lot of things that I've been conditioned to believe will produce life for me. And yet, we see that Jesus literally says, deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Jesus gives them this description of how you become a follower or a disciple of Jesus. If you are going to find your life, Jesus says, first you must become my disciple. Which just means that you and I must be in a constant state of formation. That our decisions are constantly inviting you and I to literally become more transformed into the image of Christ. When we think of the salvation kind of ordis salutis, as it is called in some theological places and, 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 and writings, there are three steps. One is called justification. One is called sanctification. One is called glorification. Everybody pray after me. Say justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification simply means that you are deemed worthy and justified in the presence of God through the one-time work of Christ's literal investment of his life for salvation. That you don't have to earn salvation. You don't have to earn God's favor. You are justified one time. Because what Christ did once, he did it for all and it need not be done over and over again. Justification. That you are worthy because of Christ's love towards us. Christ's love towards us makes you and I worthy one time of God's unearned love and favor. And that one time worthiness stretches across the whole of your life. It just means that you ain't got to keep trying to earn God's love and favor. God says, no, I've got a one time act that stretches across the whole of your life. Yeah, yeah. Pastor say, I am justified. I am justified. But then sanctification then is the process of how we become more reflective of the image of God. Which just means, although I am justified, part of what it means to become a follower of Jesus is that for the rest of my life, I am deciding to follow Jesus, the ways of Jesus. And you know what? When I decide to follow the ways of Jesus, the sanctifying process of the Holy Spirit begins to chip away at those pieces of my life that get in the way of me being able to say boldly, I am walking in the way of Jesus. Sanctification is the act of you and I getting fear chipped away from our life. Hatred chipped away from our life. Greed chipped away from our life. Violence, selfishness, unforgiveness. It is the process of you following Jesus into a way of life. And it's kind of like, you know, the only way you can fit through this door is to be sanctified. Mm -hmm. And we all got our own door that we got to fit in. I mean, my door may be a little bigger than your door. <laughs> but as I squeeze through this door, the Holy Spirit nicks a little piece of that bitterness out of my spirit. I am being sanctified. As I squeeze through this door, the Holy Spirit nicks off another part of my life that is malice I am being sanctified as I engage in the disciplines of prayer and fasting the Holy Spirit is nicking parts of the pieces off of my life that cause me to not follow the way of Jesus faithfully 
And it is this lifelong process. Everybody say lifelong. It's a lifelong process. There is no such thing as you being fully sanctified while you are breathing. <laughs> now, what you think about this? You can and are justified once and for all while you are breathing. But for the rest of your life, you are being sanctified through the work of Christ's spirit in our lives. And then the final thing is glorification. Everybody say glorification. Glorification is just that future expectation that you and me and we will forever be with God. Some call it heaven. Some call it the afterlife. Some call it eternity. I'm here to tell you glorification is a part of our expectation as followers of Jesus. Justification, sanctification, glorification. When we deny ourselves, listen to this, I want to suggest to you that the process of denying yourself is a requirement for us to find our life in God. Because there are impulses, there are desires, there are proclivities, there are our, 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 our practices that we are prone to without much effort that if we keep practicing without some occasional self-denial, <laughs> they will not get you closer to finding your life. As a matter of fact, a follower of Jesus who does not commit to self-denial is in danger of being caught in excess that leads to death. I remember in some of my uh, addiction studies classes when we were, and I was going through my undergrad process, you know, we, we learned about our bodies and, you know, the pharmacology of, of how addiction works, that when you are... Uh, biologically addicted to a substance, my professor literally said that most of our bodies are wired for addiction. Because your body sends all kinds of endorphins and kinds of stimuli to your brain, pleasure, pain, you know, peace, happy thoughts, sad thoughts. And depending on your pharmacology, your, your biological construction, you can get addicted to a feeling that a substance creates. It doesn't happen for everybody the same way, but it does happen for most of us, which led him to say that we are wired for addiction. We are wired, many of us, to experience pleasure unending. We will seek pleasure when in some respects, if we will keep it real, sometimes we must deny ourselves what feels good in order to accomplish what is necessary. Just a very mundane example. I would love to sleep every day <laughs> until I just decide to wake up because it feels good. But there are some days where the alarm clock or the sun is shining in my face. And I say, oh no, why must I? Why must I rob myself of the pleasure of two more hours of sleep? Why, no, I have to literally force myself some days to get out of bed. Force myself to go to therapy, force myself to go to the gym, force myself to do things that may often feel like I'm robbing myself of pleasure, but yet the result actually gets me closer to the life I want. Can you think of the things in your life that God is consistently inviting you to deny yourself of? 
because too much excess of what you like is literally causing you to lose your life. This country, our culture, is one that has not figured out how to deny itself of violence, of imperialism, of othering, of exclusion. We are a country that, from its inception, has always tried to get as much as it can by excluding as many as it can. You should think about this, right? Well, I was in a conversation with some folk about voting, and they were like, you know, um, you know, voting is so important. And I was like, absolutely, but you got to remember that the largest block of voters in this country are non-voters. <laughs> like the people who, who don't vote, they're the biggest block of voters in this country, and that is by design. From the beginning of our country's history, not everyone was intended to vote. From the beginning, it was just supposed to be the landowners, wealthy, elite white men. And everybody else was, you know, just kind of going to literally be ruled by the voting majority of the elites. And our fight from our country's inception has been to increase the number of people who have access to weighing in on who gets to have a say in the direction of this country politically. All that is just to say that even though we know that in order for us to have massive inclusion, we must be willing to literally deny our impulse to only make it available to the people we like and agree with. But when we have inclusion, it literally reflects God's creation. That God created with massive diversity. From the beginning, God created with massive inclusion from the beginning. And we are stewards of God's creation in that we find our life when we find the capacity to ensure that all are counted in the path towards life, peace, love, and justice. We're getting ready to take communion in a few moments. And the process of communion, as has been given to us, is that we all come to the table. All of us. Everybody say all of us. We all come to the table. This table was set up by Christ, not by me, not by you, not by the church. This is one of the oldest practices of Christian faith that was literally initiated by Jesus. And we have found ways to exclude followers of Jesus from the table that we did not like. And yet God continues to compel us to say, you can only find your life if you enter into my life. My life, the table that has been literally set for you that says that I and we are living sacrificially, one with and for one another. My life, this table that says that I am willing to have my body broken for the sake of others. Literally meaning that Jesus has created an inclusive salvation for all of us and then invites us to come to the table and say, I opt in to this way of life. And guess what? The early church fathers and mothers talk about first, second, third, fourth century Describe the sacrament, the bread and the wine, as grace. Gifts as, as a catalyst, a spiritual catalyst. That the more you take the sacramental bread and the wine, the more grace or strength it gives you. It is like you're taking a supernatural health pill to help you be more faithful in the growing edges of your life. I'm trying to get my weight under control. I, 
I, I caught COVID again in October and they put me on prednisone for like four or five months and it just caused the brother to blow up. So, you know, I'm trying to get it all together and so I, I was looking for, you know, uh, the trainer and he told me, you know, one thing you could do is, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, literally work on your proportions and so rather than eating several meals a day, maybe eat a protein, do a protein shake and you know, don't eat after this time, do some fasting. So I've been looking for these, uh, you know, protein shake things. And so I got a, a, a Venus Williams superfood protein shake. <laughs> and I was reading the superfood thing, and it's got all these ingredients in it. It's fascinating. I don't understand how it all gets into this protein shake. Maybe I'm being misled. I don't know. Said asparagus, all this kind of stuff. Stuff that I like, I'm sure it ain't going to taste like asparagus. But the point is... By taking this special formula, it literally helps me to become more healthy, more strengthened, more prepared to move throughout my day successfully towards a more healthy lifestyle. I want you to see communion, the sacraments. I want you to see your spiritual disciplines. I want you to see the practices that we are invited to engage as followers of Jesus as a similar catalyzing agent in your life. The more we engage in the practices of faith, the more they teach us, empower us, sanctify us to be a faithful follower of the ways of Jesus. And I am convinced, as the scripture has said, you and I find our lives when we are willing to lose those parts of our lives for the sake of Christ's work in our lives. Stand with me, everyone. Let's prepare ourselves for both communion and some time of prayer. Grab the hand of someone next to you. God, I pray for the person who I'm touching today. I pray for their strength. I pray for grace. I pray for them, oh God, to find their life in you. Whatever journey they're on, God, it is not lost upon me, God, that there's some dissonance there. There's some conflict. There's some struggle. There's some narratives that are literally competing about how they will find their life. Will they continue to hoard to themselves or will they figure out ways, oh God, to open up to the abundance that is found in you? I pray, God, that as I gently squeeze their hand, I squeeze, God, the possibility of life and peace and wholeness that only is a result of the pursuit, the ultimate pursuit of you. I find and I pray, God, that life will emerge from the things that are placed in their hands and the decisions that must be made related to the things they're called to steward. Those small decisions, God, will be fueled and informed by the act of denying themselves, taking up the cross, willing to go through the struggle and following you. And I pray today, God, that as we find life in you today through the act of this Eucharistic practice, this sacramental practice, may we find grace May we find strength. May we find spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen.